from MHRA, no major adverse reactions that are new have been identified following the booster program. In addition, today, the UK Health Security Agency, UKHSA, are publishing data on the effectiveness of the booster dose. And their data show that there has been an increased protection against symptomatic disease following the booster dose in those who have already received it so far. And the protection that's been added is such that there is over 93% protection against symptomatic disease. Whilst we don't yet have data on protection against hospitalization and unfortunately people dying from COVID-19, we can expect the protection to be even higher than that figure of 93% uh, because that's what's happened so far in the vaccine program. So overall, we're advising now that the data tells us the booster dose markedly strengthens existing protection and will extend the duration of that protection against serious disease. We therefore urge people who are eligible for a booster to step up and have your booster and maximize your protection. The second update to give today is about 16 to 17 year olds. You may remember that in early August, we advised a first dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine for 16 and 17 year olds who do not have an underlying health condition that puts them at higher risk from severe COVID-19. We said at the time that we would review the data and anticipate that a second dose may well be advised. Now, that is indeed the case. We have reviewed the recent information regarding uh, the safety and the benefits of a second dose, and we are advising that uh, 16 and 17 year olds who have had a first dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine be offered a second dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. As a reminder, the first vaccine dose gives a high level of protection against serious disease, and that high level of protection we know lasts for at least 12 to 16 weeks. The second dose, nonetheless, reinforces that protection from the first dose and is important in extending the duration of protection, not just for the winter months and Christmas, but we're also looking into 2022 and beyond. There is um, a question about the spacing and the timing of the second dose compared to the first dose. Uh, we are advising that the second dose is given 12 weeks after the first dose. You may remember that uh, at the very start of the vaccine program in the UK, uh, the JCBI advised that second doses of vaccines be given 12 weeks, which is an extended interval, after the first dose. We now have quite a lot of data to show that the extended interval uh, increases the level of protection and by doing so probably extends the level of protection. We also have emerging data to show that the extended interval between dose one and dose two also results probably in less adverse reactions. So there are overall benefits in keeping an extended interval between dose one and dose two. Therefore, for 16 and 17 year olds, we're advising that the second dose is given 12 weeks or more after the first dose. In summary, there are two updates we're giving today. The first is for a booster dose for persons aged 40 to 49 years old, and a second dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech vac vaccine for 16 to 17 year olds. Both of these updates are important to maximize our protection against this virus and I strongly urge anyone who is eligible for these vaccines to come and have those vaccines. Thank you. Thank you, Wei Shen. I am now just going to make a few um, overarching remarks to follow our two technical experts um, before we open for some questions. So I think it is clear that we are now moving at considerable pace um, with the booster program. The UK data show so far 
that in adults aged over 60, after boosting with a messenger RNA vaccine, that's either Pfizer 30 micrograms or Moderna 50 micrograms, as Wei Shen has explained, we're achieving well in excess of 90% protection against symptomatic infection, irrespective of which vaccine uh, people had as their primary course. And on the basis of those figures, I would therefore expect protection against hospitalisation and death to be even higher after boosting once we have the data here in the UK. For now, we look at the Israeli data uh, and some key publications there showing that in people aged over 60 in Israel, after a messenger RNA booster and compared with simply having received the first two doses of Pfizer in their, in the case of Israel, three to four weeks apart, they are observing a tenfold reduction against all COVID infections, an 18.7-fold reduction against hospitalizations, and a 14.7-fold reduction against mortality, and that's on top of the initial course of Pfizer. So I believe, therefore, that if the booster program is successful and, and with very high uptake, we can massively reduce the worry about hospitalization and death due to COVID at Christmas and for the rest of this winter for literally millions of people. It really is as simple and decisive as that. Now, JCVI is independent and it is thorough. It first showed its independence when it advised on the 12 week interval for vaccines at the beginning of the UK programme. And at the time, it was publicly criticised for doing so by the British Medical Association and the World Health Organisation. But the data now show that JCVI was right and many nations have now followed the UK strategy. So um, whilst vaccines have fundamentally changed the course of the pandemic in the UK and the high uptake of the initial programme has saved countless lives and help restore our freedoms in a, an unprecedented way, it is also clear that protection will wane over time, and uh, after, that is after the first two doses of, of a primary course. And that's especially so in older adults and those with risk conditions. And that explains why we've already made the decisions we've made about the booster programme. But the waning signal, whilst smaller, is also beginning to show in the 40 to 49s. And without boosting, I would not expect it to be static. I would expect it to increase. So JCVI has again acted decisively and recommended that the booster program is now extended to 40 to 49s. On 16 to 17 year olds and the announcement today of the second dose, Confidence has grown with time that two doses of the Pfizer vaccine is the right choice for this age group. You've heard from Dr. Rain that confidence has also grown over safety. In particular, the very low risks of suspected myocarditis compared with the long-term benefits of a life without COVID illness and COVID disruption. JCVI has used the data in an extra safety step of adding in that 12 week interval um, for the second dose in 16 to 17 year olds without risk conditions. I have full confidence in both of the decisions that have been announced today. The UK expects it to have enough supplies of vaccine to implement these changes. The details of how to access the boosters for these extra two layers of protection will be announced in due course by the NHS. But in the meantime, I would say it is still a priority and a priority ordering for the booster doses. Age is still the biggest risk factor. Um, the elderly, adults at risk and health and social care workers remain the top priority for boosters. And we should never have a case where 40 year olds without risk conditions are vaccinated en masse whilst 
many 60 and 70 year olds are waiting for their boosters. But the natural timing of when we implemented the initial program should mean that in the main, there is a natural ordering to the time at which somebody becomes eligible for booster at six months. So I don't expect to this, this to be um, a significant problem. So the NHS is moving at real pace now, boosting 300 to 400,000 people today per day, but all of this will stay, still take some time to achieve. And I want to make another plea to people who have not been vaccinated or have only had one dose. It is now very clear indeed that one dose is not enough of any of the UK deployed vaccines and that no doses at all massively increases the risk of hospitalisation. The latest UK Health Security Agency data um, show that for uh, the age band 18 to 29, the rate of admission to hospital with COVID is 1.4 per 100,000 if double vaccinated, but 7.8 per 100,000 if unvaccinated, which is fivefold higher. And for aged 30 to 39, those similar rates are 4.1 per 100,000 for the double vaccinated and 17.3 per 100,000 for the unvaccinated, which is four times higher. So just to finally summarise, the UK COVID programme is evolving as the data evolve. Two further evolutionary steps are announced today. And this is how we go forwards. Wait for the data, move the dial. Wait again for more data, move the dial. Develop confidence and certainty with every step. People keep asking me about Christmas. I think for Christmas and the winter period, we can expect respiratory viruses to be around and we are particularly concerned that flu will come back and add to our problems. And it could be quite a bumpy few months ahead. But everyone has a key role to play in achieving as safe and disruption-free a winter as possible. Wear face coverings in crowded places if it is practical to do so. Increase indoor ventilation whenever you can. Make sure you are vaccinated. And like any medicine, make sure you finish the course. And when you are called for your booster, please come forwards at pace so that we as a whole UK can get on and finish this job. Thank you very much. I'm now going to open this uh, meeting for questions. The first of which I think is from Fergus Walsh at the BBC. Hi, Fergus. Thank you very much indeed. Um, can I ask, uh, firstly, um, is it inevitable that we are heading towards third booster doses for adults of all ages? Um, and also, is there an ethical question about giving booster doses in the UK and other richer nations where, while some poorer countries are struggling for first doses? Wei Shen, would you like to take the... Um, uh technical question about consideration of boosters for lower ages than 40 and um, I will uh, handle the other one. Yes, thanks very much. Uh, so indeed it may well be that adults who are under 40 years uh, might require a booster dose or a third dose at some point. Uh, we don't know whether that is definitely the case yet. We are looking uh, very closely at the data all the time and should there be sufficient signal to warrant a third dose, so a booster dose for this age group, then certainly we will, we will announce that and advise that accordingly. Um, as regards the remit, remit of JCVI, uh, we are tasked obviously with advising what is best for the UK population. Uh, so I'll pass back to CCMO regarding the other part of your question. Thanks, Fergus. So no, nobody working in public health would um, question for one second um, the, the, the ethos that until we're all safe from this virus, 
no one is fully safe. And um, there is, of course, a global public health concern about making sure that as many countries and as many people around the world have access to these vaccines. But equally, um, our job as advisors to the UK government is to give advice relevant to the UK, and that is what we do. Um, we, advi we advise our ministers, and the UK has a massive programme of um, vaccine donation underway in parallel to our own um, vaccine programme, which is advised by JCVI. Next question is from Emily Morgan at ITV. Emily. Hello, thank you very much. Um, given that only a third of the over 50s have come forward for their booster jab right now, do you really think that extending it to the over 40s is going to make any real significant difference to hospital admissions this winter? Thanks for the question. Um, Wei Shen, maybe you might start on talking about the um, rapidity of the response to the booster dose and help answer some of this question. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to remind everyone uh, that uh, we know increasing age is related with increasing risk of severe illness. Uh, increasing age is also related to uh, the rates of waning of protection from the first two doses. And so the priority must be that we offer vaccination and we encourage vaccination in older people initially. Um, the fact that a third of people who are over 50 are eligible um, suggests that we have still some way to go to encourage as many of the people who are already eligible for their booster dose to be vaccinated so that they can have the maximum protection for themselves. Um, by extending the booster program to 40 to 49 year olds, we're not looking just to this winter, uh, but also looking to the longer term protection because uh, there may well be evidence to suggest in the future that the third booster dose pushes up the immune response and pushes out the immune response so that it lasts for much longer. Uh, and when I talk about much longer, we're hoping that the third dose, the booster dose, will mean that protection does not wane within six months or just after six months, as we're estimating now, uh, but may be pushed out to much, much longer than that, so many more months. Uh, so it's not a short-term view. Uh, this is a long-term program. Uh, we're looking to the health of the nation, not just this Christmas, but maybe even up to next Christmas. So, Emily, I think what we're saying is that we are trying to um, future-proof the COVID-19 vaccine programme through the advice of JCVI, we're trying to future-proof the, the UK and its um, efficient functioning in the future. On um, the timing, you're right, there just isn't a second to waste now. And it's really important that we keep the clinics running at full capacity, all hands to the pump. And it's really important that the moment patients are notified that they are eligible for their booster, that they make whatever arrangements are necessary to get themselves a slot booked for vaccination as soon as possible. I'm turning now to um, Ashish Joshi at Sky. Good morning. Thank you, Professor Van Tam. I was just really struck by a phrase you used just at the end. You said we should take our medicine and finish the job. Do you see the finishing line in sight and what would it take for you to think the job has been finished? I think that we are in for um, some potentially difficult months over the winter. We're at a very unpredictable point in the epidemiology. Um, the the modelling is getting more difficult to um, give us any very clear sense of whether things will turn up or turn down in the next few months. So I, I regard it as still a time of great delicacy and uh, quite a bit of um, near-term danger. Do I personally frame that if our booster programme 
goes well and vaccine uptake remains high, that we will be in a, uh, a much set of calmer waters by um, the middle of spring, then I, I think I do. But this virus is unpredictable. Um, we are still really very early on after it emerged in humans, and there are still many more lessons to learn. And we have to be constantly vigilant for the concern about a uh, variant that might give us more of a problem than we currently have. So um, lots to play for still, um, not a time to relax, but I do see once the spring gets here, hopefully some calmer waters ahead. Uh, Laura Donnelly at The Telegraph. Um, hi. We've been told that the um, definition of fully vaxxed could in future include boosters. Um, I wanted to ask when that's likely to happen for those in the over 50 category and what that could mean for travel, uh, a, qu uh, a question for um, Professor Van Tam. And, and just one more practical question in terms of the timing of, of the booster rollout. Um, as I understand it, at the moment we've had about 12 million people have had booster jabs and we've got about 32 million eligible by Christmas. You've just announced another 8 million uh, people in their 40s will be eligible. Given all those numbers uh, and the numbers that we've done so far, you know, being far much smaller than that, what would you expect to happen by Christmas if the vast majority of those eligible haven't been vaccinated? Would you consider, would you expect the government to have to consider other measures? Um, Laura, I, your, your link dropped out to me, so I didn't catch your first question properly. Could you repeat it, please? Sure. Um, yeah, we've been told that the definition of fully, fully vaccinated could in future include boosters that, you know, at the moment to get a, a COVID passport, a vaccine passport is to two, two jabs and that in future that could extend to three. I wanted to ask when that's likely to happen um, for, for those that are eligible at the moment and what that could mean for travel. Right. So um, the questions about um, changes to certification and uh, uh, thinking about boosters as part of that um, it is a matter that ministers decide and if you if you'll forgive me i will stick to the science on that um so it is just a science fact that we are seeing waning of the primary course and that means that um it is over time your protection against infection particularly begins to decline without further reinforcing vaccine doses which we call boosters now there is therefore a kind of logical point at which you would say to yourself, well, what does certification mean any longer if it is, I'm, I'm making up the figures now, two years since I had my primary course of vaccination? What does that actually mean in public health terms? And it's our job to um, uh, present the science to ministers on that. Um, the other thing I would say is that, um, you know, I don't know, and, you know, it's a very complex um, situation around the world, how different countries are viewing certification and whether certification will will or will not be um, here uh, a year from now, for example. I just don't think we can look that far into the future. But I can say on the science, there will come a point when um, what you had and when you had your primary course of immunisation may be less important than when you were last um, vaccinated. But that's all I can really say at this point. I don't know, Wei Shen, if there's anything you would particularly want to add on the kind of, um, uh, on the vaccinology in this area. Uh, I, I don't think so. Uh, you said most of what can be said. Uh, we certainly can't advise on what vaccine certification should look like. And that does involve both the UK and other countries, so it is more complicated. Uh, in terms of the science, um, whilst there is waning from the first two doses as we see it now, uh, it is by no means the case that protection against severe disease wanes to the extent that there is no protection at all after the first two doses. Uh, it's just dropping but not dropping to zero. So somebody who is vaccinated uh, is still 
better protected than somebody who has never been vaccinated. At least that's the case for now. Laura, you um, very sneakily snuck in a second question, which, of course, I've now gone and forgotten. So if you could repeat that one as well, please. Yeah, sure. Is it the numbers, really? So uh, so far, about 12 million people have had boosters, um, but, but about 32 million, I think, as of today, uh, will, would be eligible by Christmas. Now you've announced another 8 million. What, what I'm asking is, if you can't get through all the bulk of those people by Christmas, are there any other measures that the government would have to consider? So we know already that, um, as Wei Shen has said, that two doses of vaccine are, as part of the primary course very dramatically reduces the chances of hospitalisation and death. But let's focus on hospitalisations for a moment. So that's already very dramatically reduced in the UK. And you can see that through the kind of freedoms we've allowed. Um, I've um, tried to do my best to extrapolate from the Israeli data this morning that that extra booster dose um, you know, has a massive additional impact in reducing hospitalizations. If, um, if, we, if we don't proceed at the right pace and we don't proceed um, in terms of uh, people accepting the vaccine, then there will be more hospital admissions than there, than there would otherwise have been. But um, I think you're kind of hinting at um, you know, extra measures and plan B, and I'm, I'm not in a position uh, to, to judge that at the moment. Sam Blanchard at The Sun. Thank you. I just wonder if you can say anything about if we've seen an impact of the booster rollout on the statistics at the moment, and would you have expected to see more cases, deaths, and people in hospital now if we hadn't started the booster rollout? So, undoubtedly, I would expect by now um, to have seen more in the way of hospitalizations and deaths in those very old, older groups in whom we started the booster program earliest if we had not started it, because the evidence suggests that the antibody response and the protection pick up very rapidly after a booster, um, much more rapidly than after the initial primary immunization course. But we don't yet have any signal from the UK Health Security Agency over our picture and our ability to assess the impact of boosters on hospitalizations and deaths. There is absolutely an analytical plan to do that and to get those data. But as you know, infections come before hospitalizations, um, sometimes a couple of weeks before with this illness. And those kind of data are also slightly more difficult to assemble. So please just give us a little bit more time, a few more weeks, and then I'm very confident that we're going to see a signal that is, um, uh, I would say, um, broadly re very similar to the, to the Israeli signal. Um, Eleanor Hayward, our last question today from the mail. Um, just on the issue of vaccination for children, um, uptake rates in the UK are very low at the minute compared to a lot of other Western European nations. Um, how would you like to see this addressed? Um, do you worry about the impact low uptake could have over Christmas when you've got children mixing with elderly grandparents um, and things like that? Wei Shen, would you like to start on that one? Uh, yes, and uh, in fact, I might bring in uh, MHRA on this because uh, it may well be that there has been... Um, some uh, reluctance to have a first dose of vaccine in 16 to 17 year olds because of concerns around safety. Uh, but as we've heard earlier on, actually the data are now uh, firming up such that it is looking much safer than was feared initially. So uh, my message to people is that um, we are more confident about the safety of doses in 16 to 17 year olds and we're more confident about the benefits to 16 and 17 year olds. Uh, so I would urge uh, any 16 to 17 year old who hasn't had any vaccine dose to certainly uh, consider having at least the first dose and in due course think about also having the second dose. I don't know whether you want to add anything. That's absolutely right, Wei Shen. As the data have accrued, we've become more and more reassured that the safety picture in young people and children, teenagers, is just what we've seen in the older population. 
uh, and no difference in terms of the small, very small risk of heart inflammation between the first dose and the second dose. So our message today is definitely come forward for your second dose. Thanks, June. Thanks, Weisha. And, and I agree. I don't think, um, you know, this is something to fret about. I think it just becomes clearer over time that everybody is more confident in the value of um, vaccination and in the very reassuring safety data that MHRA continue to look at on a daily basis. And, you know, parents and children must, must decide um, for themselves. And, you know, we should allow them the time and the space and give them the highest quality information so that they can make those decisions in, the, in their own time. Thank you very much indeed um, for your questions today. And uh, I now call this press briefing closed. Thank you.